The following interview was conducted with Professor Owen H. Gaylor, Professor Emeritus of Nuclear Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, January 7, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon and good morning to you, sir, and I thank you very much. Let's start out. Tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Okay, I was born in Rochester, New York on November 10th, 1925 in the Alexander Street Hospital. Okay. What a memory. Um, my parents, uh, Sam Gaylor and Thelma Gaylor, had both immigrated in separately, though, from Russia, uh -huh. uh, where my father met my mother in Rochester, New York, through the, through the uh, auspices of a marriage arranger. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, now where do we go from there? Um, what was your grade school like? And then tell us a little bit about high school, where you went to high school and okay, your students and things. school, I think, was uh, public school number 31. I think that was a number on Field Street in Rochester, New York. Okay. And uh, outstanding teacher there. The only one I remember there, two other, one I remember there was Mrs. Tozier. She was a, she was reported to be a real terror in the third grade. <laughs> I didn't find her so at all. Okay. We were all afraid when we went to her class. Uh, but we, that, we we managed to muddle through, though. Yeah, we muddled through. That's, about, <laughs> that's the story of my life. I muddled through all the way through. Uh, anyway, after that, then to the university, uh, to uh, Monroe High School. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that. Were there any student clubs and what oh, program? Yeah, student or? clubs. Uh, I was president of the chess club. I was president of the camera club. I was a member of the... I'm also a member of the camera club. I was a photographer for the school newspaper for the school yearbook. Good. Was it a large high school? Um, well, considering high schools nowadays, no, but it was reasonably sure. large. It was okay. reasonably large. Rochester okay. had about five or six large regional high schools. Sure, okay. What uh, What was your program? Were you uh, Was it a college prep or what type of? Yes, it was a college prep. You see, I had followed my, my brother and then my brother, my sister, and my brother mm -hmm. uh, before me who went to the same high school, and uh, I came in with their credentials. Unfortunately, I did not have the brain power or the, <laughs> or the uh, inclination to be as smart as either they, they were. Mm -hmm. So I failed my first year of French Oops. and had to go to summer school for French and English the first, the first, okay. uh, to the first year. Sure, okay. And I had been put into the class of the, the, uh, the higher achieving students those who were expected to achieve much higher, uh -huh. and I, I didn't. However, by the time I got out, I was, I was back into that class again and, and standing out and helping other students in the class. Very good. Uh, good. A uh, highlight there was uh, tutoring the girlfriend of the high school basketball captain. Oh, <laughs> that sounds that very good. Yeah. That's a challenge. <laughs> and did college come next? And tell us a little about your college life. Okay, well, I got out of high school a half year ahead of time. Uh huh. Was this in a, a winter, like in January? Would that would have been? Yes. Okay. That's right. And I worked at Eastland Kodak Company as an errand boy in the electroplating laboratory. Okay. Just for, for a few months until college started, the University of Rochester. And I guess it was June '43. Uh huh. And I went to through, through the University of Rochester in a in a math and physics. Uh, uh, my major. Mm -hmm. uh, to the 1946, it was uh, you know, straight through with no long summer vacations. Mm -hmm. And um, did you live on campus? I, no, I oh. lived in. I lived well for the first two years. I lived at home. Mm -hmm. and the last year, I lived on campus. Okay. Okay. Now you were going to school during the war years. What was it like up around during that time? Well, uh, you didn't have to ser serve in the military at all then. I was years, well, going back, uh -huh. uh, so, let's see, uh, going back many years, I was discovered to have a heart murmur. Oh, okay. And so when it came time for the pre-induction physical, uh, two of the three examining uh, doctors decided I was not fit for, sure. for uh, du duty, so I was a 4F. Okay, okay. Um, so things weren't too bad. Okay. Uh, I maintained a low profile because I felt very very conspicuous as not wearing a uniform. Sure, okay. Uh, at the University of Rochester, there was a large naval... Uh, uh, was that B12. like a v, the V-12 program? V-12 program. Which yeah. we had here at Purdue as well, oh, I think. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, I met some of those students, not many of them. Sure. 
and uh, oh, some 15 years ago, we went back to a uh, a reunion. A reunion, and uh, only only four of the uh, total number of students who were in that class attended. Most of them were either uh, had gone oh. or were still serving. I just couldn't make it. Oh, okay. One of the smartest people I ever, students I ever met, was one of the Navy V-12 students, Alan Liss. His mm -hmm. name stands out. He was a really bright guy. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we had a few years in college. Okay. And uh, and then I was well, a photographer, and uh, I guess that was my only interest. I was not in, not interested in sports sure. except to watch. There you but go. many times on a Saturday afternoon, I would be in the chem lab doing an extra analysis experiment okay. and listening to the, to the football game through the open window. Okay, sounds good. You got the best of both worlds there. I think so. <laughs> okay. Then after, now you graduated in what, 46, is it? Yes, graduated okay. in 46. And then what came next? And next, next came uh, a master's program at Purdue. Oh, okay. How did that come about? Well, one of my friends in high school, a guy named Miles Davis, who, uh, went to Purdue. Uh huh. And so I knew the name. That was all I knew. Okay. And when it came time to apply to graduate schools, I applied to a couple. Purdue answered me first, and I answered them first. And so I went to Purdue. Very good. As I said, I muddled through most of my life <laughs> with so fortunate choices every time. <laughs> what was the campus like when you arrived? Nothing like it is now. Oh, well, oh, of course, boy. you know. I arrived... Uh, Early July uh -huh. of '46. Uh, okay. And one of the one of the first things I saw. Well, we had a little Siberia. I don't know if you know what little Siberia was. And at the corner of over the university and uh, over right there at the corner of, of uh, Perry Hall. Oh, okay. I know the general location you're talking about. And uh, there was a big empty field there, but it, uh, along University Street there was a Naval ROTC building and a. Uh, a series of, of uh, fraternity and sorority houses. Sure. And one of the very first days I was there, I was walking across Little Siberia going from Cary Hall where I stayed to the physics building. Uh -huh. uh, the ground was littered with pieces of paper, burned charred pieces of paper. It seemed like some enterprising Purdue students, as usual, had loaded the naval uh, uh, cannon with homemade powder, left the ramrod in and fired it, and the ramrod went right to the women's uh, sorority house across the street. Oh my gosh. So later on that day, the muzzle of that cannon was, was welded closed. <laughs> Rather quickly, right? We action was taken. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Where did you live when you came to Purdue? Did you well, first I lived at Cary Hall. Oh, okay. And I became a counselor at Cary Hall. <coughs> well, that's good. And I became a counselor, actually, at Seneca. And this was a temporary, I think it's gone by now, building, which was built to house an awful lot of the returning veterans. Okay. And so I and another fellow were the, young, were the youngest people and the counselors in this dormitory full of veterans. Oh, my goodness. That was an interesting juxtaposition, I'll tell you. There I, were some problems. I can imagine. Right. Were you married at the time you came? No. Oh, okay. I was not married. Okay, okay. Now, you, then you stayed on after you finished your master's. And what, no, what program no. were you enrolled in? At, in engineering? Uh, no, no oh. uh, in physics. Oh, okay, I see. In, in physics. Okay. No, I left after getting my master's degree. I, I, my major professor was Professor Carl Lark Horvitz, who was essentially the father of Purdue Physics. Right. Really I recognize great, the name. Uh -huh. A great guy who had his uh, faults and so on, but I made a good impression on him, and from then on I could do no wrong. Great. <laughs> so I got my master's degree, and I was tired of, of uh, pinching pennies, so then I took a job at the National Bureau of Standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I met one of my major uh, acts, uh, one of the major places where I learned something. Uh, contrary to high school and to college, and in particular at Purdue, I learned at the Bureau of Standards that your superiors are not necessarily superior. Mm, okay. Uh, I had my hand on the telephone to call the head of the Bureau of Standards to ask for a transfer when he called me. And as a result of that, I ended up uh, observing and instrumenting some atom bomb tests out in Nevada. Oh. Called the Buster Jangle tests hmm. just outside of Reno. Okay. I mean, just outside of Las Vegas. Okay. That was an interesting I, experience. I bet. How long were you out there? I was out there for three months. Okay. And okay. on the way back, I stopped at Purdue uh, just for kicks, and I was in the li library, and Professor Lark Horvitz came walking through, and he said, ah, Mr. Gaylor, I see you are here. 
I said, yes, I'd like to come back. And he said, okay, do so. And so I returned to Purdue as a Ph.D. student. Okay. No uh, did, was he also your major professor then, too? No, oh. my major professor then became Ernst Bloiler. Oh, okay. He was a great guy. Uh-huh. And uh, our interests were more uh, common. Uh, our cohorts' interest at that time was in uh, solid state. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Then, so, um, well, then I, not, what, after you finished, what, what came next? Go ahead. What came next uh, yeah. was uh, accepting a, looking for a job and accepting a job with uh, a place called Combustion Engineering, whose offices were in the Twin Towers in New York City. Ooh. But when I arrived there for to go to work, I was told they had moved and they were up in, in Connecticut. So I went to Simsbury, Connecticut, where or East Windsor, I think it was, where Combustion Engineering was located. Mm -hmm. And there I inherited... Uh, I was uh, immediately told to don't unpack. We're sending you to Westinghouse for years on the job training. Combustion engineering had a job of, of uh, building, designing, and building a the, the nuclear power plant for a sub for a submarine. Hmm. And so I was sent to Westinghouse and I power division, where I got most of my technical training mm -hmm. on the use and application of computer programs to reactor analysis reactor analysis and statics, i got to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. okay. And I worked for, for uh, a few months in what they call the critical area, where experiments were being done. Then I was transferred to the analysis area, where the analysis of the experiments was carried out. Mm. And that was, that was a, really, uh, a really learning I time. bet. Great and opportunity. It fun, yes, it was fun being in Pittsburgh, too. Mm -hmm. uh, then after that year, I went back to Purdue, and became for a very short time. I became the the head of uh, of the reactor statics analysis section. Okay. The uh, the the at that time head of the reactor analysis section uh, was rather unhappy with my arrival and uh, left to go. I think to, to Atomics International. Mm -hmm. So I became the head of a group of some 14 people who were trying to figure out what it was they were measuring and why they weren't getting the rap proper results. And, and using experimental techniques, meaning experiments in nuclear reactors are, are interesting if you can use a computer. Mm -hmm. There's no danger involved. Sure. And so you use your computer and you try this and that. And using some simple-minded analysis, uh, we were able uh, to uh, get very good uh, agreement between what had been measured and what we had calculated. Okay. So that was that was one of my major one of my major uh, contributions to the, to the system. Good, okay. At that time, combustion uh, was one of the three places working with uh, the Navy. There was um, Westinghouse and General Electric. And the methods that we developed, uh, I think I'll ring my bell at least once with my help, mm -hmm. was so good that the Admiral, have you ever heard of Admiral Rick Over? Yes, I have. Okay, well he told, the people at Westinghouse and at GE to come to Combustion to find out how we did it. Wow. Uh, it was nothing great. It was just using some common sense. But it was working, and that's what they wanted to see. It was working, yeah. Sure, was okay. Working. That's right. the key thing, right, okay. Uh, then uh, after this design, well, then at Combustion, I was also uh, designed uh, nuclear power. Uh, this is all the physics part, none of the, me none of the mechanics and mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. of, of uh, a nuclear superheater and uh, power plant for, for uh, I think it was uh, oh, Bo um, Boston, Baltimore, Baltimore Power, I think was the was mm -hmm. nuclear power plant. <laughs> uh, let's see, where was I then? Um, You're still with combustion and you went to Baltimore? Yeah, I was still with okay. combustion. Um, while at Purdue, by the way, while I was a a uh, master's student and being a counselor at Seneca, I met a guy called Paul Zmola. He was a uh, faculty sponsor at Terry Hall. Uh, I've written the Purdue alumnus magazine about this combination. He was a good friend and a good drinking buddy. And at, com at Combustion Engineering, suddenly I found myself in his group for a while mm -hmm. in a, in a uh, design competition for designing a nuclear-powered oil tanker. Oh, okay. <coughs> Competing with combustion and with uh, General Electric and Westinghouse, and 
uh, I remember one particular time during a meeting with the prospective buyers, I guess, it was, I don't know who they were, Paul was asked if, he, if his design could Butterworth. And Paul immediately said, oh yes, of course. And then as we were walking down uh, Fifth Avenue, perhaps, anyway, going back to, to uh, Simsbury from New York, where the meeting took place, uh, we asked Paul, what is Butterworth? And he said he didn't know, we better find out. <laughs> um, I remember this because uh, in a recent alumnus magazine, there was a obituary for Paul. Oh, okay. Too bad. Okay. But Butterworth thing would just spraying hot water on the tanks to clean out the oil. Sure. Uh, then the uh, arch enemy of the admirals was hired by combustion engineering to take over their nuclear division, and the admiral pulled all naval work out of combustion. Mm. And so I had the fun of, of uh, letting some 13 of the 14 people who worked for me go. Wow. Uh, that was no fun at all. Not at all. Never is. Never no, was. No, no, it was. Never. And about that time, I got a call from Professor Powers at Purdue saying, how would you like to come to Purdue to teach? And uh, I jumped at the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And after a few months of negotiation back and forth and accepting a considerable loss in income, I went from combustion back to Purdue. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was in 1962. Uh, okay, all right. Now, did nuclear, the, uh, was this, it would be in nuclear engineering? That was nuclear engineering. We okay. were just a department at that time. Okay. And shortly after I got there, uh, let's see, I guess Val Bergdahl was the head of the department. We had two heads. Val Bergdahl was the local head, and then Phil Powers was the uh, head of the head. Okay. Uh, I noticed in your in your letter to me something about the uh, <clears throat> dedication of the Purdue Purdue One reactor. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, there was a pair of uh, Republican uh, congressmen. I think it was Dirksen and, and Capehart uh -huh. at that time, and Capehart gave an, an address, uh, and I remember him saying that comparing the cost of the Purdue reactor. Uh, the number, I don't remember what it was, but he said, this is, isn't even a tip compared to what we spend in Congress. Oh, interesting yeah, comment, yeah. Uh -huh. Where were you, where was you located and in, in what building? And tell us a little about the early days then when you came, doing some teaching, et cetera. Yeah, well, uh, my office at first was in the basement of the Duncan Annex, the Duncan High Voltage Annex next to the electrical engineering building. Oh, okay, yeah. That's, that's, that's where the reactor is or was. I'm not sure what's happened since then. Sure. So my, my office was there. Uh, first job I had was teaching an advanced reactor physics course for which I felt very inadequately prepared. And I've always managed to stay at least one lecture ahead of the class. Okay. Had some very good students at that time. Um, then good. after a while we got switched to the, uh, um, not the Michael Golden Shops, the building has been subsequently removed. It was facing Northwestern right oh. at the bend of the campus. Oh, uh, uh, the L Michael Golden? Yeah, Michael Golden. Okay, right. yeah. And then part of that was when they built Kanoi. Yeah. Right, so okay. So my office was there. Mm -hmm. The lab was still in the Duncan Annex, but the office was there mm -hmm. uh, for many a year. And then again, it was changed to, uh, boy, I don't remember. That's okay. Can tell us about the early days, and then how about enrollment, and, and uh, was this prime, the program initially, was it an undergrad or a graduate program? It was a graduate program. Okay. And we got uh, essentially the cream of the crop, by mm -hmm. the way, uh, very, okay. very good students. Sure. And it's, it's enough to spoil a teacher to have such students, and also uh -huh. to keep them on his toes. Sure. Um, well, what, was the what was the campus like? Uh -huh. It was uh, relatively quiet. Okay. Um, were there many students? How what was the enrollment? Was it uh, enough? And did you increase your faculty too at the same time? No. Okay. No, I wish I could count the faculty. It was a relatively small faculty. Okay. All right. Uh, let's say ten or so. Okay. Maybe even less than that. Okay. And the student enrollment was in the order of uh, the teens. Okay. Well, that's a good I, ratio. Sure. If I remember that, right. Right. Yeah. Okay. What, what was some of the research that you were working on? You make a comment on that. Well, my research was, was mostly on the design of reactors mm -hmm. and the analysis of reactors. Okay. 
developing an analytical tools for for better and quicker and uh, more thorough analysis okay. predictions. Okay. I was uh, head of the reactive safety committee, making sure that anything they did out of the ordinary with the Purdue reactor was was done in a safe manner. Sure. Okay. Uh, right. I had been I've been in the same position in combustion engineering. Uh huh. Okay. The uh, years, say from '62 to '75, then the enrollment increased. And did, did when did an undergraduate program? When was it open to the undergraduates? I wish I could tell you. Okay. I don't remember, but we did become a school of nuclear engineering. Right. Okay. And we did have undergraduate students. I sure. Remember. Right. Did uh, somebody came? Did Professor Powers stay for a while? Was he the head? And then yes, Professor okay. Powers stayed for quite some time. Okay. He was sort of split between Purdue and the Argonne National Laboratory. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, and then after Powers, I'm not sure if I have the right or the right uh, sequence. We had Professor Sasansky who sort of stood in for Powers, and Powers wasn't there. Okay. Alex right. Sasansky. Okay. Who, as far as I know, is still in a retirement home up in uh, in Oregon. Okay. All right. And then after Sasansky, we had. Uh, Would have been Lycoudis to that come um, or not? I'm trying to think. Lycoudis was in and out. A couple okay. Times. Lycoudis. Okay. And then temporarily, Gleichmann. Uh, okay. And yes. Lycoudis again. Right. Okay. Now the facility, you know, where the nuclear building is now, it's just sort of adjacent to Grissom. Is that um, is that where you where your office ultimately in there as well, where nuclear engineering is? Oh, hold on a minute. Now, where is Grissom? Uh, Grissom Hall would be was, was on Grand Street. Uh, that used to be the civil engineering at one time. Uh, it's right there on uh, Grand Street between uh, North and Northwestern. It's not too. It's close to where Michael Golden probably was, and you know where Kanoi well, yeah, Hall is yeah. on the corner. Yeah, that's where I forgot. I had an office in there for a while. Too. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, the old, the old, uh, uh, the old railroad building. Ah, uh, yes, yes, right, exactly. <laughs> oh, um, any other, any of the highlights that you'd like to share with us in the nuclear, um, in the program, and and your affiliation with it? Also, are there any university committees that you served on? Well, oh, university committee, I was uh, uh, for a short while uh, chairman of the uh, Committee on Faculty Relations. Okay. A uh, very short while. Uh-huh. Uh, exceedingly helped by the ex-chairman uh, of that committee. Mm -hmm. I was in charge of our department's uh, student co-op program. Oh, okay. I had to go around and find jobs, for, you know, co-op jobs for students. Sure. That was quite interesting, um, meeting many people out in the field. Right. I was, um, oh, let's see. Did you ever serve any on the Senate at all at any oh, time? Yes. Oh, yes, I was a Senate member a couple of times. Okay, okay, all right. Um, what were some of the, uh, for the career path for some of the graduates, what were some of the areas that they went into that were during the time you were here? Okay, well, one, one student who was quite outstanding and not my student at all became head of, of radiological medicine at a, a southern university or Southern Hospital. I can't okay. remember his name, darn it. Okay. Yes, I remember Paul Watlett, I think it was the name. Okay, okay. Uh, then there was, uh, let's say, the outstanding moment. I had a student called Hitchell Kim, who who uh, was called to Purdue oh, some, what, 10, 15 years ago uh, for an honorary degree. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, flown to Purdue to attend and participate in the program. Oh, that's, that was when he got a DEA? I think so. Right, in 97. I was going to ask you about that. That's very nice. Had you kept in touch with him over time? No, I had. Okay. It came as a complete surprise. It was a call to me from, from the department head saying that could I come out there and do such and such, and of course I was thrilled to do so. Oh, yes. Kind of nice to renew relationships and then interact with the person. Yeah, he's the one that is, he's the CEO of some company in Seoul, isn't he? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes, as he told us, he, his father was a, 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 shall we say, a big shot in, uh -huh. in, in, in the company. And his father said when he came back from Purdue, he said, okay, now you've had your, now you've had your, your university training, now let's go to work in my business. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> but Hitchell Kim uh, did a very interesting thesis. Uh -huh. We had one of, one of my few papers, one of our few papers, in which he he could have, but he didn't tear apart the results of another of another school's department head's paper, in which the department head blamed 
the discrepancy between his measurements, rather between his calculations and the measurements on experimental error, mm. whereas it was really due to a application of uh, sophomoric analysis methods, which were okay in simple textbooks, but not not in real life. Mm. And Hitchell Kim's results came out right on the nose with the experimental results. Oh dear! Oh, how nice! That's nice to know, right? It is. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Any any other awards or honors that you received during your time at Purdue that you'd like to share with us? Anything else come? Um, well, with works and honors, I was a consultant in many different places. Okay. Uh, All right. Mexican Electric Company. Uh-huh. Uh huh. For their Dos Dos oh. Mundos power plant. I don't know if it ever got built or not. Sure. Argon Electric Argon National Laboratory for their work out in Idaho. Mm hmm. Uh, the public service company of Indiana when they were planning on building a reactor. Mm -hmm. uh, Northern Indiana Public Service Company for the same reason. Sure, okay. A uh, summer lecture with the Babcock and Wilcox Company. These are the people who built the well-known uh, Three Mile Island computer uh, oh. reactor. Okay, okay. Uh, that poor guy, from, uh, I was also many, many times in charge of getting speakers for our colloquium. And sure. the speaker, one, one morning the speaker was the in charge of the Babcock and Wilcox reactor. Uh -huh. And when he woke up at, at the union to come give us a talk, he discovered in the paper about the accident at the Three Mile Island. His, uh -huh. his talk was a little bit different than he planned on. I can imagine. Yeah. All right. <laughs> were you ever, um, um, Professor Gaylor, were you ever a faculty fellow at any of the residence halls? No, I wasn't. Oh, okay, okay. Um, how about professional associations? Do you have any offices in any of them? Well, for a while, for the American uh, Nuclear Society, I was chairman of the uh, Reactor Standards Committee Okay. Uh, for quite a, a short while. I think that was the name of it. Okay. I was also the, the uh, Commonwealth Edison representative to the American ASME Committee uh, on their standard writing for reactors. Mm -hmm. And a member of the American Physical Society. Sure. Okay. Do you, uh, do you still keep in touch with some of the uh, people on the in within associations? No, I don't. Oh, okay. I've been practically incommunicado for the last <laughs> okay. 21 years or so. Alrighty. How about a uh, Purdue tradition? Do you have a tradition that you'd like to share with us? You, um, Purdue tradition? I really should have, having gone through graduate school as well as sure. teaching there, but I don't really have a, a okay. particular tradition. Okay. How about an outstanding event? You can have more than one. Well, the, the Hitchell Kim event was, was the most outstanding, I oh, think. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And can tell us a little about family. Where did you meet your wife? I met my wife, well, the year that, the, after I got my master's degree, when I was yeah. at the National Bureau of Standards. Okay. Uh, the second week, and I went to the, the, the National Gallery of Art, um, and that's where I met her. Oh, how nice. You're, was she there, was she working there, or was she just looking no, at something? She was there, her husband had been killed out in Kansas, he was a tractor accident. Okay. And, uh, oh dear. It's okay. It's okay. Um, she was there taking an art course at the Corcoran Gallery. How nice. And she came to the National Gallery of Art, and I was there mainly for, because in the evenings they had a, a uh, chamber music concert. Okay. And so we met at the cafeteria before the chamber music concert. How nice. And I talked to her into going to the chamber music, and from then on, all is history. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> did, did you have children? Yes, we oh. have a, a, a son, Steve, uh -huh. uh, son Stephen. Actually, I got the son and the wife all in the same deal. Oh my goodness, how nice! As I told him, he's such a great guy. If I had, if I could pick and choose, I wouldn't choose anyone other than uh, him. Did the, Did he come to Purdue? He went to IU. Okay, and that's he went all right. To Purdue Cranner School, though he did get his master's in Cranner okay. School. Okay, he got allegiance with two universities then, huh? That's right. Oh, <laughs> an outstanding event. Okay, my yeah. daughter. Okay. Who. Uh, uh, while a young, oh, she, she'd be a, a, a young teenager, an older teenager, uh, was a ballet dancer. Uh -huh. We used to drive her to Indianapolis for classes three times a week or so. Uh -huh. uh, she was dancing with the with Ballet West okay. uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Salt Lake City. And the company came and pre performed at Purdue, oh. and we had the whole company over to our house oh, how for wonderful. reception afterwards. That was an outstanding event. Oh, I would say so. How nice. What a what a nice occasion, one that you'll always remember as well. Yes, we always will. And there was a Mr. Webster, who was in, whose wife was in charge of Clark Flowers at that time. Oh, my goodness. And he uh, 
he actually knew this was happening. He was he was a, a, a uh, officer at the Lafayette National Bank. Oh, okay. And uh, he brought a, a bouquet, a big bouquet of flowers. Uh, for the occasion. Oh, how nice. He was, a, he was a great guy. Great. That's nice to know. How about retirement activities? What, so what, uh, tell us about what you've been doing. Okay, well, uh... Did you stay on, after you retired, did you stay on in Lafayette for a while, or...? No, I retired immediately. In fact, I left the Lafayette a half year early. I retired a half year early. Okay. Uh, we had, my daughter had had a, a young baby daughter and mm -hmm. was living in Fresno, and, uh, we visited them, and I fell in love with this little girl, and I figured... This is a long ways away, and I want to be around while this little girl is growing up. Sure. And so being uh, only a few months away from retirement and talking with the re Purdue retirement officer who pointed out that I would actually get, at least for the first year, what amounted to a raise if I retired, I retired about a half year early Okay. and moved to Fresno. Okay. And in Fresno, I did uh, contact the, uh, the Fresno uh, Computer Club. And through that contact, I got in touch with, or I was in touch, I was touched by the uh, Fresno City College to come teach computer programming. Well, how nice. So I taught there for a couple of years until I had a, quite a disagreement with the, uh, the department head. Uh -huh. um, I was a part-time teacher, and I actually was asked to take down the department headship. It was a rotating headship, so there was wasn't because of uh, ability. It was because of who's uh, who's available. <laughs> or who's next in line, right? That's about it. But I decided <laughs> that uh, having seen department heads doing things that they really didn't want to do, and I took the best part of teaching, which was teaching. I didn't have any committee assignments. I didn't have sure. any of that other nonsense. I just taught and went through the problems of testing and so on. Sure. <laughs> I think maybe now I should have taken that job, but that's that's hindsight. <laughs> oh well, it's okay. Are you still doing that? No, no. After the argument, I stopped. Okay. I, uh, I've given a few lectures at uh, at uh, Fresno City, uh, at Fresno State University on on the Purdue reactor and reactors in general. Okay. And just well, while I was at combustion engineering, there was the only uh, fatal accident, fatal nuclear power accident out in Idaho something called the SL1 incident, which no one even knows about. Mm -hmm. And um, I have made a study of this because while I was at combustion, I was um, very involved in, in looking at the results of that accident and trying to figure out what was happening and what had happened. And with the, um, now I'm on my soapbox now, with the current push towards nuclear power, I want people to be aware of all the stupid mistakes that can be made, mm -hmm. either mistakes, errors, uh, omissions, whatever you want to call them, and I've offered here in Fresno, there's a group called the Fresno Nuclear Energy Group that wants to build two French power reactors in the valley, mm -hmm. and I've written them letters twice offering at my own expense to come talk about this SL1 accident just to show what can happen if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. Neither one were answered. However, I did give a talk in the local college on that accident, okay. and I'm hoping to stir up some interest in it. Okay, sounds good. Um, in closing, is there anything I forgot to ask, or and if not, is there something <laughs> you'd like to sum summarize in uh, in your own words? Well, uh, for no, let's see. One thing, I am a uh, victim, a self-inflicted victim of publisher parish. Huh. Okay. If you'll notice, I'm an associate professor, not a full professor. Okay. And the major reason is because, now maybe some of this is sour grapes and some is true and some isn't, I saw some of the garbage that was being printed and I couldn't print that kind of stuff. <laughs> and I was too insecure when I came across something good to print it anyway. So I didn't want to print anything unless I was absolutely sure of it. Sure. That's my excuse for not having many publications. Okay. Also, and this is also a little bit of sarcasm, I suppose, I was much more interested in working with my students in the computer lab at three and four in the morning, which I often did, mm -hmm. instead of staying home and writing papers. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's okay. We, have all, we all have our, our interests and our challenges and we handle them. Throughout all of this whole time, from high school right through until a couple months ago, my major interest and love has been photography. Okay, well good. That's kind of your special interest then, right? Very special interest. Okay. So you saw camera club in high school, camera club in sure. college. I took pictures for the Purdue alumnus, uh, for Gay Cotton, if you know uh -huh. Gay Cotton. Right, I recognize the name. Yeah, uh, football.
football games, which uh, there was a little bit of, of uh, education. Speaking as a nerd now, uh, my attitude towards football players might be rather negative. But when you're on a 30-yard line and you watch those guys make split decisions, you realize that they're not as stupid as you thought they were. <laughs> that's, a, that's right. That's a, they got to make that call and hope it works. Right, yeah. And you see how close some of those calls are, and how close, how close some of those scores are. It gave me a completely different understanding and respect for the big hawking giants. Right, sounds good. <laughs> uh, anything that, uh, anything else that uh, you want to say, or you think we're is that pretty much covered for you? Let me go through my notes here. <laughs> okay, alrighty. Uh, I think that that pretty well covers everything. My okay. complaints and, and my uh, uh, my positives okay. as well. I'm I'm going to thank you very much and don't ha uh, don't hang up because I want to make a comment. I want to thank you, Professor Gaylor, for the opportunity.